Joe's Phil Hartman and Jan Hooks, his dad and mom, with Philip Seymour Hoffman and Brittany Murphy as their teenage kids, all sitting in the living room. Hartman. Now, I hate to sound like a broken record here, kids, but we have a problem. Murphy. What's that, Dad? Hartman. Well, your mom found a joint that can be purchased legally in the area. And, well, Hoffman. What's the problem? Hooks. Oh, dear. Hooks starts to tear up. Hartman hugs her and says, They're there now, sweetie. The reason it bothers us that the joint we found that can be purchased legally in the area is, well, you paid way too much for it. Hoffman. It's just easier. Hartman. Now, son, you can't expect me to hand over my company to someone paying twice the rate he could be paying if he were a little more savvy. So for that reason, I hired the cousin of a motivational speaker. Murphy, so you didn't get us a motivational speaker? Just the cousin of one? Hartman, it's the best I could do on short notice. Knock on the door. Hartman goes to open the door and says, that must be the cousin. Hartman opens the door and it's Crystal Farley, hat on, glasses, dressed in blue shirt, tucked into khaki pants. Hartman, hey Pat, good to see you again. How's Matt doing? Farley. Matt's dead as a doornail, Dad, but thanks for asking. Farley walks over towards the kids on the couch, squats, and says, Are these the two geniuses spending $100 on an ace of bud? The four, uh, the four family members can't figure out if Pat is a man or woman. Murphy, you said it's Pat, right? Farley. You bet your ass that's my name, and motivating is my, well, was my cousin's game. And now I'm stepping in, in order to prove to my selfish Hoffman. So is it short for Patrick, or Farley whips off the glasses and shoves them in Hoffman's face and yells, Mr. Moneybags over here thinks he's worthy of interrupting me when he spent his whole allowance on a measly eight. I got that for $10 in my day. It's criminal what you're doing to yourself. Hooks whispers to Hartman. Is it he or she? Hartman. Uh, I forgot to ask. Farley. What can we do to get you back on the right track? Hoffman. Or is it Patricia? Farley. You're a funny man, funny man. Murphy. Good one. Farley. Oh, we'll get to you, princess. Just you wait. As for you, sonny boy, what do you want to do when you grow up? Hoffman. Well, I was thinking I could make an audio show spoofing Saturday Night Live, except everybody's black. Something like that. Farley walks over to Hartman and says, Well, Daddy-O, what do we have over here? Is that the next Lord Michaels over there or what? Looks like Lord now wants to make in living color. Hartman. Well, uh, Pat, Patty? Farley. Pat Foley. Hartman. Right. Well, we encouraged him in his writing. Farley turns back towards the kids and says, You want to go be Billy Shakespeare? Go for it, brother. But if you're going to be spending $100 on an eighth of doobies... You're going to be smoking doobies living in a van down by the river. Hoffman, and you know this because, Farley, because I live in a van down by the river. Murphy, who do you live with? Farley, my partner, Alex. Hartman, okay, hmm, Pat. This has been wonderful, but I think it's about time we wrap this up. Farley's pants fall down, but the shirt he is wearing goes down to his knees. The four family members all go down to the floor to look up Farley's shirt. Hooks. Oh, my God. Hartman. I can't believe it. Farley. That's right. I'm a hermaphrodite, bitches. And live from Tom's phone... We're not alive! It's Saturday Night Live! Starring an ever-evolving cast that is unionized and refuses to allow their names to be mentioned
attention until their demands are met. Musical guest, Aretha Franklin, and your host, Antonin Scalia. Ladies and gentlemen, Antonin Scalia. Applause, applause, applause. Scalia. Hello. I'm delighted to be hosting this program. Gives me a chance to set a few things straight. For one thing, beyond politics, at the heart of the dispute between, quote, liberal and, quote, conservative members of the Supreme Court is how to interpret the Constitution. More liberal-minded justices tend to interpret the Constitution as a living, breathing, changing document, while I and others, such as the Honorable Robert Bork, Robert Bork comes out, applause, 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 Scalia. Others, such as I and Robert Bork, interpret the Constitution to not be a living, breathing document, but instead one that has a fixed meaning from the time of the founders. Norm MacDonald comes out dressed as a piece of long parchment. MacDonald. Hey, guys. I'm the Constitution. Scalia turns to Bork and says, Well, what do you think, Robert? Bork. I say stick a bork in him. He's a goner. Ruth Bader Ginsburg comes out. Applause, applause, applause. Scalia. Well, hello, Justice Ginsburg, my dear friend. I hate to break it to you, but we have here the Constitution. It turns out he's as dead as we are. Ginsburg. That's not the Constitution. That's Norm MacDonald. MacDonald. Rats. Scalia. Okay, Ruth, well, you win this round, but just because this happens to be Norm MacDonald, that doesn't mean the Constitution is alive. John Belushi comes out as a zombie piece of parchment. Ginsburg. How about we just agree that the Constitution is an undead zombie? Scalia. Well, how about we read the briefs and go from there? We have a great show tonight. Aretha Franklin is here. So be ready to show her some much-deserved R-E-S-P-E-C-T. We'll be 